Welcome to the Journal Editorial Report. I'm Paul Gigo. Voters in five states headed to the polls this week, and some razor-thin results have spurred a debate within the Republican Party over just what role President Trump should play in the midterm campaign. Although the president declared victory on Twitter this week, boasting that he was five for five with candidates he endorsed in Tuesday's races, narrow margins in a special election in Ohio, and in the gubernatorial primary in Kansas are causing some to raise questions about his claim that a giant red wave is coming this November. Let's bring in Wall Street Journal columnist and deputy editor Dan Hanninger, columnist Kim Strassel, and editorial board member Alicia Finley. So, Dan, uh, after you look at Tuesday's results, how much trouble is the Republican Party in in November? Uh, I would say the Republican Party is indeed in trouble, Paul. Look, the baseline is that Ohio 12 race where uh, Troy Balderson uh, seems to have won by less than 1% against the, the Democrat. Uh, look, on a scale of 1 to 10 in competitive House races, Ohio 12 should have been about a 9 for the Republicans. Balderson should have won that by a lot more than less than 1%. The remaining competitive seats, and there are about 34 of them, are all maybe a 5 or a 6. They're going to be much tighter than Ohio 12. The math suggests that whatever happened there, perhaps uh, women in the su upper middle class suburbs staying home, whatever happened there is going to lean heavily on the remaining competitive Republican districts. There's no, no way to sugarcoat it, Paul. That is the conclusion from what happened there. Yeah, Charlie Cook, who uh, analyzes House races, said there are 68 more House, uh, House seats that Republicans now hold that are less Republican than that Ohio 12 seat. So that puts some, and a lot of these are, are going to be in, in play, Kim. Uh, particularly these suburban seats. Uh, the rural areas, Trump and the Republican Party still holding very strong. But it's these suburban swing districts which are most to play. Yeah, you're seeing that in these election results, you're seeing that in polling, that Republicans have a problem in suburbia, particularly among college-educated voters, uh, women college-educated voters, who are very down on Donald Trump. And so if you look at that Ohio race, for instance, uh, where Balderson really fell apart was in the suburban part of that district. The farther you got away from Columbus, the more rural the area, he really tallied, racked up the votes. Um, but it, in, and it still was barely enough to win. But this is something that's a, a dangerous proposition for Republicans having to rely on simply large turnout from rural voters everywhere. Uh, Alicia, let's broaden the field a little bit to the governor's races, which we know we tend not to get a, give as much attention to as the Congress, but are very important. And Republicans have, I think, 31 Republican seats now, including uh, most of the upper Midwest. But what did we learn from Michigan's primaries? Well, there was a much higher, like 130,000 more Democrats voted in the primary than uh, Republicans. And I think you're going to really have a hard time in the upper Midwest. You, you said Scott Walker is up for re-election in Bruce Rauner in Illinois. Uh, and again, Michigan is a vacancy where Bill Schuette won the Republican primary. He kind of wrapped himself around Donald Trump. But Donald Trump only has a 35% approval rating in Michigan. And I think also if you look at Kansas, if Chris Kobach wins, he's run on a very anti-immigrant line. I think that's going to really alienate a lot of voters, moderate voters, even there. Well, Jeff Collier is uh, uh, the uh, uh, competitor. We don't know who's going to get the nomination. That's very, very close. But even Kansas, Kansas should be a Republican layup. And you're saying... It should be, but, you know, it's Kathleen Sebelius was the, the former HHS uh, secretary in the Obama administration was the governor there. So they have had Democratic governors. Okay, Kim, I know you've been talking to your sources in the GOP. And what are they telling you uh, about, I guess, uh, the optimism line. What's the case that they're going to upset convention here and do better than anyone thinks, even if it's not quite a red wave? Yeah, so here's what they'll say in the White House. Uh, some people have been critical of the president going out, doing these rallies, talking about very controversial subjects like immigration and trade, saying this is what's alienating these voters. Now, the White House and others will make the opposite claim. They'll say, look, the only reason Balderson won was because Trump went out there uh, and he excited those rural voters and he got them to turn out. 
We believe that we would never have gotten a lot of these, these suburban voters anyway. They've got, they baked it in against Trump. So the only thing we can do to combat that is get out our base, really turn them out. And, and so that's what you see happening. It's working in Ohio. So we'll be able to replicate that come fall. That's their argument. So their argument is, I guess, uh, Dan, let's uh, polarize the election on issues, cultural issues like uh, immigration, for example, immigration enforcement and, uh, uh, and soft sell uh, the economy, which is doing great, and, uh, and tax cuts. Uh, let's not focus on those. Let's make this a cultural battle. Smart strategy? It works for Donald Trump. There's no question about it. The question is, does it work for these other individual Republican candidates in individual races, such as Barbara Comstock running in Northern Virginia, where she is in a very tight race, and cultural issues do not play. Does it play in the seat that's being vacated in New Jersey by Rodney Prelinghuysen? A clearly a very centrist seat in which the Republican is uh, competing with a highly financed uh, former Marine woman and prosecutor. In those situations, Paul, I don't think the cultural issues are going to play. They're going to have to run on what they have achieved, which is an extraordinarily strong economy. And some of these candidates are asking, let me do it myself. I can carry it if the president doesn't come in here and uh, ruffle the waters with uh, immigration and uh, trade wars. I guess the politics of this uh, are, are different in the Senate, Alicia, uh, briefly. I mean, you've got Trump in the cultural division. May work better in some of these states like North Dakota, Missouri, and uh, uh, Indiana where Trump won. Maybe, but then you have to consider that there are three Senate seats, Arizona, Nevada, and Tennessee, that Republicans currently hold that could be in play for Democrats for just the opposite reason in so far that the immigration, the backlash against the president's immigration policies may hurt Republicans there. That would be particularly in Nevada. In Nevada and, and Arizona. Arizona. Less so in, in and Tennessee. And Tennessee, but they have a strong Democratic candidate there. And, and Phil Bredesen, the former governor. All right, thank you all. Still ahead, President Trump goes on the attack, blaming bad environmental laws for exacerbating the devastating wildfires in California. We'll take a closer look at the president's claims and what's contributing to the blazes when we come back. This is part of a, a trend, a new normal that we've got to deal with. And we're dealing with it uh, humanly, financially, and governmentally. Firefighters in California battling several major blazes across the state, including the largest wildfire in its history. The Mendocino Complex fire is now bigger than the city of Los Angeles, and officials say it may not be contained until September. President Trump seized on the issue earlier this week, suggesting that California's environmental policies have exacerbated at least a dozen large fires in the state right now. The president tweeting that bad environmental laws are magnifying the fires by not allowing massive amounts of readily available water to be properly utilized. He added, must also tree clear to stop fire from spreading. We're back with Dan Henninger, Kim Strassel, and Alicia Finley. So, uh, California and Alicia, why are these fires as severe as they are? Look, they were pretty severe last year, and they've actually started earlier this year. One reason is you really high temperatures, especially up in the north. You're, you have a heat wave. High, heavy winds. Right. And a lot of dry vegetation after seven or eight years of drought. We had, plus you had actually one wet year, which uh, that was gave, last. The that, that was the previous year, which actually gave, or provided more vegetation overgrowth. And so they, the fires have more fuel to burn. Okay, let's take the couple of the president's issues: the water. Is there a shortage of water to fight the fires? Not to fight the fires. But there is a shortage of water in California, a huge shortage. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that there are environmental restrictions to protect fish, namely the smelt and salmon in the delta where all the rivers from the north run into. And that's where the water is in the mountains, the Sierras, right. and in the north. in Lake Shasta, and they're right. using some of that water to fight the fires. But because of these pumping restrictions, very little of the water actually moves down Where does it go? South. Instead, it goes basically flows out to the ocean. So they literally yes, take literally. fresh water that they could use down south and pump it out to sea. 
pumping juice. They, they let it flow. Like, they let right. it flow into the sea. Flow into the sea. Okay, so that th what that does, it doesn't hurt in the north where the fires are now, where they have plenty of water to fight it. But where it hurts is creating further dry conditions in the Central Valley and, and in the, the south. Southland and in Southern California, where you have had some fires. One, there's one now raging in South or in Orange County, South Orange County. All right, Kim. Let me go to you. I know you follow this closely when it comes to tree clearing and fires in the West. Uh, is the president on stronger ground on that claim he made? Oh, absolutely. This is a ground zero problem for why you're having fires. And by the way, not just in California, but throughout the Pacific Northwest, uh, Alaska, other places where going back 20 years, the federal forest, uh, the logging ban in federal forests kicked off uh, a trend, and you see it too, driven at the state level by very bad environmentalist policy that's a leave it alone approach. Uh, you know, the USDA did a report in December, said 129 million dead trees in California. And there is a reticence at the government level to go in and really do any logging, cutting, thinning. And this is what's providing the fuel for these fires. When they get raging, you can't stop them. Well, this is a, a, a puzzle for me, Kim, and I'm, I'm a Midwesterner, not a Westerner. But why wouldn't environmentalists want healthy forests? So why wouldn't you want to clear... Uh, some of this stuff out so that it, 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 it is less vulnerable to, to these raging fires. Well, it's the problem with most modern green environmental policy is that it actually doesn't do much to help nature. It is an involuntary reflexive belief that man should not interfere at all. You do not manage nature. You let nature take its course. But if you're going to do that, uh, you're going to end up, for instance, right now they estimate in the Sierra Nevadas have four times as many trees in them as that you would in a normal healthy forest. Uh, we used to be able to have these massive fires uh, that could just burn and clear everything out, but we can't really allow that anymore given population and the devastation they cause. So the, your alternative is to go in and manage them mechanically with cutting. Dan, so uh, Jerry Brown, the governor out there, has uh, he blames climate change. Of course, he blames just about everything bad that happens out there on climate change. Uh, but uh, uh, at some point, when do you take responsibility as a political leader? Okay, even if you, let's say he's right, and this is related to changing climate. Uh, government has to do something. Uh, they do have to do something, but uh, Jerry Brown uh, and the Democrats, the Greens, have put themselves in a position where they're simply incapable of moving. And I want to pick up on uh, the point Kim was just making. Uh, you know, one uh, alternative to this is in these vast areas of running controlled burns, where you do burn down some of the forest to clear the area. I mean, they are forests, they're full of trees, trees are wood, and wood burns. But for the last 100 years or 200 years or so, this country has set aside vast areas of the West and they have not, and they've been untouched, as Kim suggested. They're too big for the federal government to manage, even if they were going in and doing that sort of thing. And as she suggested, if you allowed logging companies to go in, private, uh, private owners, they would be responsible for keeping these forests in healthy shape. They're quick, not healthy. Quick question, Alicia. How much does the state of California spend on tree cutting? Uh, very little relative to uh, how much they're spending on the electric car subsidies. Which is about... Uh, they're spending about $300 million on electric car subsidies. And in a given year, they may be spending $30 million on tree cutting. So 10 times on uh, electric yes. car subsidies for rich people in suburbs. All right, when we come back, the Trump administration stepping up sanctions this week on Iran and Russia. What the moves signal about the administration's approach to both countries next. We're going to continue to be loud with the international community that there have to be changes from Iran. The Trump administration stepping up sanctions this week on both Iran and Russia. The White House said Wednesday that it will impose fresh sanctions on Moscow after determining that it used a nerve agent on British soil in March in an attack that sickened the former Russian spy and his daughter 
and killed a mother of three. This, as reimposed sanctions, took effect on Tehran, the first since President Trump pulled the U.S. out of the Iran nuclear deal earlier this year. The president warned Tuesday that anyone doing business with Iran will not be doing business with the United States. Cliff May is the founder and president of the Foundation for Defense of Democracy. So, uh, Cliff, welcome back. Good to see you again. Let's start, though, with Turkey. I want to talk briefly here at least about Turkey. The president using sanctions and serious sanctions to uh, try to get uh, the Turks to return uh, uh, Pastor Brunson to the United States. What do you think of the use of sanctions for that purpose? Well, I think in general this administration recognizes a rule that, and that is any nefarious behavior that you do not punish you in effect license and so we have multiple countries now taking americans hostage that Tur that turkey should take an innocent pastor he's been there twenty years he ministers to a small flock of, of, of protestants he's being accused of things there is no evidence whatsoever that he is in any way involved in anything nefarious there uh... the idea that he can just be held hostage and various demands made on us is pretty as astounding especially when you consider that turkey is a a nato ally um, and i think trump has been very frustrated by Erdogan on this and on, and on other scores as well. But it's going back and forth. Erdogan says, I'm not going to give in. Uh, uh, and Trump is ratcheting it up late in the week, saying he's going to double metals tariffs on Turkey. And you've seen what's happened to the Turkish lira, just really falling out of bed and creating real uh, nervousness across a lot of currency markets. And so there may be some global implications here. How, how risky is this? Well, it's risky, but it's mostly risky to Turkey. And you would think that, the, that Erdogan would do the rational thing, which is say, okay, America is my ally. We're NATO members. I can't be holding an innocent American in prison for years. Uh, and I, and, I, and I, have to, I have to do something about that. I've got to make up with them. Instead, of course, Erdogan is, being, is moving closer and closer to Russia. And NATO, after all, is meant to protect Europe from Russia predominantly. He is also undercutting American policy vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis Iran. So he is at best a frenemy, a, certainly an unreliable ally, and I, th I think a crisis is coming with Turkey sooner rather than later. All right, interesting. Now, you mentioned Russia, President uh, Trump administration, imposing ratcheting up sanctions, this time for chemical weapons use of that nerve agent in the UK. But here's the question I think a lot of people are asking. The Trump administration did this. How does this mesh fit in with the president's clear desire to have better relations with, uh, with Vladimir Putin? Yeah, the, you know, what's interesting here is that Trump's rhetoric has been conciliatory towards Putin. His, policy, his policies have been very tough, uh, I think arguably tougher than any administration we've seen. We've had five uh, sets of sanctions this year alone. Uh, this is going to be very difficult for the, uh, for the Russian economy. We're already seeing also the ruble fall. We're seeing, that, uh, we're seeing other problems with, with the economy and, and in Russia, and, and more sanctions are coming. So it's policies are very tough. He's really insisting that Russia begin to change his behavior even while he rhetorically and certainly at Helsinki um, is being very solicitous of President Putin. It's interesting to watch that contradiction and see how it evolves. Let's turn to Iran, the third country that has seen uh, tougher sanctions. And this, the president is, is, is disagreeing with his European allies who don't like the fact that the U.S. has imposed these sanctions and move this week to try to protect its own businesses and say you you can do business with Iran, but is the president winning this uh, this this disagreement with the EU governments? Yes, the president is winning. Uh, I think I, I think it's distressing that our European allies are trying to undermine. Uh, the, the president's policy here. I know they don't particularly like President Trump, but the policy is meant to create change in Iran. Uh, at very least, we should no longer be funding the nefarious behaviors of Iran, whether it's supporting Hezbollah, supporting uh, Shia militias in Syria and, and Ashar Basad, supporting the Houthi rebels, uh, continuing with, um, with missile programs. We know that uh, Iran in various ways was violating the Iran nuclear agreement, the JCPOA, the, the, the Europeans have been trying to undermine the, our policies. They are not succeeding because Europe is still relatively free. The government can, 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 can't tell the businesses what to do, and the businesses are being told by their compliance officers and others, look, we can do business with Iran, but we're going to be cut out from the U.S. market, and the U.S. market is 
absolutely essential to us. The Iranian market is not. So increasingly we're seeing the European businesses saying we're going to abide by the U.S. sanctions. We don't want secondary sanctions on us and we don't want to be cut out of the market. Uh, that's very mm -hmm. frustrating for the governments, but the governments deserve, of Europe deserve to be frustrated because they should be acting with us to curb the nefarious behaviors of Iran. Uh, uh, Cliff, we don't have much time, but let me ask you one final question about Iran, and that is John Bolton this week, the White House National Security Advisor, said the U.S. policy towards Iran is not regime change. It's designed to change its behavior. Is that, is that really true, or do they secretly, privately, really want regime change? Look, they'd cry no salty tears were regime change to happen. But if they can change the behavior of the regime, um, that is helpful. If the regime says we've got to cut back on some of our overseas commitments to various terrorist groups, that's useful. If the regime says let's sit down and negotiate a better JCPOA, we have to do it, that's helpful. If nothing else, there are protests in the streets and the Iranians know whom to blame. They blame their own government for the deprivations they're suffering because they know that the oil wealth is being spent on Hezbollah and Hamas and Houthi rebels and others not on them and I and I expect there will be infighting among the ruling mullahs as a result of this as well. Alright, thank you Cliff May, appreciate it. Still ahead, Facebook and YouTube banning controversial radio host Alex Jones and setting off a debate over social media and free speech. Facebook and YouTube ban controversial radio personality and conspiracy theorist Alex Jones this week saying the InfoWars host violated their policies against hate speech. Jones's detractors say the move was a long time coming, but others argue that it's just the latest and not the last example of social media companies silencing voices they don't agree with. And they're pointing to a tweet by Democratic Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut, who wrote this week, quote, InfoWars is the tip of a giant iceberg of hate and lies that uses sites like Facebook and YouTube to tear our nation apart. These companies must do more then take down one website. The survival of our democracy depends on it. We're back with Dan Henninger, Kim Strassel, and Wall Street Journal Deputy Editorial Features Editor Kyle Peterson. So, Kyle, welcome. Uh, so, uh, let's talk about legality first. Try to break this down. These companies are—is it? Can they? decide what runs on their platforms legally. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's private property. That content is living on their servers. Um, and what Facebook wants to do specifically is Facebook sees itself as a community. It wants to be a place that teenagers feel comfortable spending some time. Um, and so what I, I, the way I like to think about it is when you're on Facebook, you're not on a public forum. You are, uh, at, you are at Mark Zuckerberg's open mic night. And if you get up on stage and start singing the Nazi national anthem, uh, you'd be prepared to uh, be asked to leave. They, they I mean, you decide uh, to run an op-ed in our paper, and it's libelous, though. We're responsible. Right. <laughs> they are shielded from even that lie from from those kinds of libel suits, uh, are they not? Yes, there was a, a law passed in the 1990s that gave them immunity from that, uh, specifically for user-generated content. So the difference is a lot of the stuff that goes up on Facebook, most of it, virtually all of it, is not reviewed by anyone before being posted. You, as the user, get to put it up. Do you agree with that, or should they? We should we not have that exception for these platforms? Um, I think that's a tough question because uh, if you remove that exception, it's hard to see how those companies could even operate because they would have to employ hundreds of thousands of people to review everything that possibly went up. I mean, they're trying to go after that problem um, with algorithms, um, and reportedly they're having some success specifically um, with getting the machines to recognize violent content, to recognize nudity, and to take that stuff down more or less automatically. As a, as a policy matter, as a, as a pr principal matter for the publishers, you agree, th you think they should, they were right to, to take down Alex Jones? Um, I think that, I honestly think that's for users to decide. I mean, the internet is a big place, and Twitter uh, came out uh, this week and specifically said it would not ban Alex Jones. Because they hadn't violated Twitter's rules. Right. So people have a choice. If, if they want to live in a more walled garden, they can go to Facebook. They can feel comfortable uh, having their teenagers on there. And if they want uh, more free speech, if they want to see what Alex Jones is putting up, they can go to Twitter. All right, Kim, what do you think about this as a matter of uh, policy on the part of Facebook? Because as I recall, and YouTube, I recall you did a Prager video uh, linked to your book on, of all things, free speech, and uh, it was in fact banned for a while. Yeah, um, they claim it was by an algorithm, uh, but it, it was a very odd situation. Look, 
does, I mean, I agree with Kyle. They absolutely have the right to do this. They're not common carriers. They're not required to just offer their platform for anyone, no matter what their views. Should they have? No, and I, I have two reasons why. One, it is going to fuel these views among conservatives that provocateur and he does spread false information he had the he, he spread falsehoods about Chubani and immigrants he was sued and he had to retract that and apologize to get a lawsuit against him dropped he said falsehoods about the Sandy Hook uh, uh, massacre uh, uh, I mean if you're gonna ban uh, it, it, so I mean that would be the argument they would make that he's not a traditional conservative and don't put us on that slippery slope to say we're gonna start banning other conservative voices yeah, I mean, that is the voice that, I mean, is the argument conservatives will make, and they, and they should make it. I mean, uh, you know, Infowars, there's probably a part of the population out there that is susceptible to that, those kinds of conspiracy theories. They've always been out there. But this is a country of 325 million people. Let's say a million people have attached themselves to Infowars and Alex Jones. Is that a threat to the country? Well, it wasn't just Facebook and YouTube that banned him. He's now been banned by virtually all the social media platforms. LinkedIn, Pinterest, Apple is taking him off uh, their, their iPod listings. The only real platform that he's on now is uh, indeed Twitter. So the question is, if you sort of, at where, where do you draw the line? I think Chris Murphy, the Democratic senator, in that remark at the beginning, let the cat out of the bag. People like him will push beyond Alex Jones and start including, say, Rush Limbaugh as a purveyor of hate speech. And there will be pressure on these sites to, uh, to draw the line much more broadly against conservative uh, opinion. Kyle, what about that argument, that this is just the start of what would be a, a, an attempt to, to ban conservative voices generally? Uh, the question I would have for people making that argument is, in April, uh, Facebook banned the white nationalist Richard Spencer. And did it make the news? Not really. Um, so the question I have is, what's different now? And the only answer that I can come up with that is that Alex Jones is pretty good at making a ruckus. Okay. You, you think they can make those distinctions? I, I think they have to. Who else can make those distinctions? It, it's obviously in Facebook's, uh, it's, it's Facebook's decisions to make, and uh, their users can decide how to react when they do. All right. Interesting debate. Still ahead, the Big Apple declares war on Uber, voting to cap the number of ride-hailing cars on its road. So will other cities do the same? The Big Apple putting the squeeze on rapidly growing industry this week, capping the number of four hire vehicles it allows on its streets. The New York City Council voting to address what it says are a number of issues that have cropped up as the use of Uber, Lyft, and other ride hailing services has grown, including increased traffic, a dip in public transit use, and financial woes in the taxi industry. So how will this affect both riders and drivers? And will other cities follow New York's example? We're back with Dan Henninger, Kim Strassel, and Alicia Finley. So, uh, Kim, let me start with you. Bill de Blasio said this week, he took a victory lap, said, oh, we did this to show that we're not going to back down from any big company. Why did he really do it? Uh, he really did it to protect the cab industry uh, in New York, which they gave a lot of other reasons. Oh, you know, congestion and there are people not riding the subway anymore. That's not what this is. This is about protecting a very complex system of regulations um, and medallions that New York issues. And they have kept those number of cab medallions artificially low to drive up the price of them and to regulate how many cabs were there. That all got blown apart when these app companies started coming in and it, it has put a lot of distress on cab uh, companies and there has been some financial fallout but that's called new technology and the answer shouldn't be to now try to extend that licensing and regulation to the entire new field but rather to start over and deregulate and let competition work. Uh, Dan, is this going to fix congestion in, uh, in, in New York? I know as a, as a loyal uh, uh, New Yorker, uh, somehow I'm not seeing that. No, it is not going to fix congestion unless the city does a better job of managing the construction projects, which have closed down the lanes of every other street in Manhattan. And the <laughs> subways. What about the subways? How many? Let's, how talk, many about, let's talk about the subways, because that's a big element here. <clears throat> Ride sharing in Uber, Lyft, and cars like that 
is being used by people who are abandoning the subways. And it's not just the wealthy in Manhattan. It is mainly middle class workers who live in the outer boroughs, Bronx, Queens, and Brooklyn. They would rather ride share than take the subways. It's a vote of no confidence in the subways, which have a huge responsibility to fix their infrastructure at enormous cost. And if they people pull away from those subways, they're going to erode further. And I think the city's solution has been Rather than deal with the reality of the public transportation system failing, they're simply going to suppress Uber and Lyft. Let me put up here the New York Post headline uh, on Friday this week, Transit Apocalypse, <laughs> about uh, the latest shutdowns in the subways and the delays, which are so extraordinary, uh, Alicia. Uh, Bill de Blasio, good, good socialist, good liberal, why would he care about the taxi cartel? Uh, they're big donors to most of the city council. <laughs> oh, break the code. <laughs> so that's the reason he, 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 he does it. But uh, I guess uh, they want to push everybody into subways as well. Sort I of think as that's an exactly ideal. right. Last two years, you've actually had a decline in subway users, uh, decline in revenues as well. But that's not because of the ride services as much as it is. Because they're breaking, the subways are breaking down. Right. About 70,000 delays per month. And that has not improved despite all the billions that they are pumping into the system. And so this is the ride shares are an escape valve. Think of them as the charter schools, transportation. The competition like right. charters, school for public Versus, schools, competition. Exactly, and they want to keep people in the public system. So, Kim, what do you think the future is here for these ride-sharing services across the country? I know millions of Americans, tens of millions, use them. They become a great alternative. If you're new to a city, you don't know how to work the subways, the cabs aren't available, you call an Uber, you call a Lyft, you get a ride. Uh, are other cities going to start to restrict this for the same reasons? Yeah, this is one of the big new urban battles across the country because you are going to have other cities, ones are actively debating this right now, as far away as Texas to the West Coast, um, and you're going to have politicians who are going to want to do the union bidding here and protect their cab monopolies. Um, and you're going to have residents of these cities who are going to revolt. And in the past, the fear of that revolt has kind of reigned in these politicians, and they have lost some of these prior battles against Uber and Lyft. Uh, they now seem to be plunging ahead anyway. But this could reverberate badly on some politicians. You know, it seems to elude them that if they had practiced, tried so hard to protect their horse and carriage industry, they wouldn't even have a cab industry right now. So. You know, change is coming, and, and the consumers want it. Yeah, I think sometimes I think Bill de Blasio uh, would have been a great mayor in the horse and buggy era. When we come back <laughs> 10 years after the 2008 financial panic, our own James Freeman brings us the untold story of the Citigroup bailout and other alarming episodes from the 200-plus year history of one of the nation's largest banks. It's been 10 years since the 2008 financial crisis and the bailout of two big to fail financial institutions like Citigroup. And in a new book, James Freeman and Vern McKinley tell the untold story not only of Citi's rescue, but of the 206 year history of what was once the nation's largest bank. James Freeman is assistant editorial page editor at the Wall Street Journal and co-author of Borrowed Time, Two Centuries of Booms, Busts and Bailouts at City. So, James, uh, welcome. Thanks. Good to be uh, here. And, uh, thank you for your patience as I work on this. I think, uh, I think you enjoyed this process about as much as my family did. So, anyway, I appreciate it. That's all right. You got a good product out there oh, and a good you. story and good work. So, uh, 10 years after the financial panic, what's your biggest lesson? Well, I think what we see when we look over this two-century history is uh, that uh, 2008 was not a, a one-off, perfect storm, unexplainable, unexpected event, but it was really the culmination of a, a century of the government standing behind city and the bank going through a series of crises, and it was such a contrast from the first century where for 80 years, roughly, it becomes the biggest bank in the country. It's an island of stability. It's really a rock that, uh, in times of crisis, depositors come to, and, and there was no government standing by. So what, ha what changed? Well, it really is the uh, creation of the Federal Reserve. When you look at uh, this this bank, that was it was so strong before the government was standing behind it, it would actually rescue the federal government at times when it was... Uh, 
in, in stress. It would rescue uh, cities that were having trouble. And but then after, it's almost amazing how quickly the bank uh, deteriorated after the, the taxpayer safety net, the Federal Reserve comes in. Uh, the, the bank starts making really disastrous loans overseas. They opened a uh, branch in Russia in early 1917, and people can Ooh, kind man. of imagine how it actually made money for a few months before the commies took it over, but uh, pretty soon they needed help from the so government. So the Federal Reserve comes in with that implicit, uh, with a lender of last resort for sure, right. and maybe an implicit uh, uh, guarantee as well. Um, the, um, but going to 2008, do you think that Citibank could have been let fail and would, would the financial system have survived? Uh, I think it could have because I think that uh, you you certainly can do what the law said which is you seize the insured depository within this giant Citigroup financial holding company you you uh, pay what it costs to uh, make people whole if there are any depositors who need money and that certainly would have been far less than the amounts uh, the government spent uh, both in terms of direct investment and the exposures guaranteeing so many of Citigroup's of assets. The government would say hey we got it all back you know so no 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 harm no foul. Yeah, and I, I should say, in the crisis of 08, it's, it is difficult, and we can't obviously run the experiment again. You had the government creating all of these problems across the financial landscape in terms of driving all these banks into housing investment. Uh, so Making it easier to borrow, very easy to borrow, uh, uh, easy implicit government guarantee of Fannie yeah. and Freddie Mae and so on. Yeah, and so I, I, part of what we try to do with the book is, is to say, uh, not just look at 2008, and, and what is amazing about 2008 is how little explanation, how little math, how little real analysis went into the too big to fail designation, but also how do you avoid getting to that point? How do you right. avoid getting to this moment where all of the regulators, or, or I should say not all, Sheila Baer was a dissenting voice at the FDIC, but almost all the regulators simply take it as an article of faith that America can't live without this big bank, that it, that it has to be saved uh, regardless of any real analysis. On that point, how do you prevent us from getting there again? Well, I think this is a great time with the, the economy going well, banks healthy again, making a lot of money to start uh, reducing that taxpayer safety net. And, and I, you don't want to jar the markets. It wouldn't happen in 24 hours. It would happen over time where you start uh, eliminating the uh, implicit and explicit benefits. And part of that is they created in the Dodd-Frank law of 2010 essentially a codification of the bailout scheme where it, it's now clear in the law, unlike before the crisis, that instead of protecting the bank and depositors and putting the holding company into bankruptcy where all failing firms ought to go. There's now a special place where too big to fail banks go to get better treatment. But every single politician, well at least Democratic politician, says too big to fail is over. Is it? It's not over. It's, it's not, not over. And, and I think... It, so you, the next it, time we get you, there, there will be another big bailout of Citigroup. Well, it's, I think it's, you look at the history, and it's once the federal safety net comes in, they ran into trouble in 1920. They got federal assistance in the 1930s. They ran into trouble uh, in the late 70s with lending to Latin American countries. A, a real estate crisis, you know, 2008 was not their first real estate crisis. So I think unless something changes, uh, we're going we're gonna to have to grit our teeth and watch these uh, awful bailouts again. We need you writing editorials on the financial system again. Yes, sir. To block that. All right, here we go. Go. We have to take one more break. When we come back, hits and misses of the week. Time now for our hits and misses of the week. Kim, start us off. So, Paul, we found out this week that about five years ago, the FBI discovered that a longtime staffer for Democratic Senator Dianne Feinstein was actually spying on her and reporting back to Chinese intelligence. <clears throat> it quietly, discreetly went to the senator, and she immediately dismissed the person. So my miss here is for the FBI on the question of, yet again, why the same courtesy of a preliminary briefing was not given to Donald Trump when they had suspicions about his own campaign aides. Yet again, another reason to wonder what all was going on in this FBI investigation. Mm, uh, uh, excellent, Kim. Thank you. Kyle. I'll give a miss to Hollywood, specifically West Hollywood, which this week the city council there passed a resolution unanimously calling for Donald Trump's star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame to be removed. Uh, the reason this is a little bit funny is because um, whatever you may think of Donald Trump's politics, he's definitionally a television star, having hosted The Apprentice for more than a decade. Um, but it's probably not going to happen because the Chamber of Commerce, which actually controls the stars, says that once you're a star, always a star, which is why even Bill Cosby is still there. All right, Kyle. Alicia. 
This is a miss to the Oscars. Uh, the ratings have been tanking in recent years, partly because they are way too long, and most people haven't seen most of the nominated movies, like The Shape of Water. So they are now condescending to the people with more plebeian tastes by adding a new category for Best Popular Film. This feels a little bit like a condescend or a consolation prize for viewers. All right, Dan. Well, Paul, I'm giving a hit to socialism for its entertainment value. We all know about the antic uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, but then this past weekend, Marcus Melitsis, the editor of the Daily Cause website, said all Democrats have to embrace socialism or be declared irrelevant to the Democratic Party. Well, days later, a reporter asked, Ben Jealous, the Democratic candidate for governor, whether he would self-define as a socialist, he said, are you kidding me? Welcome back, Karl Marx. All right, that's it for this week's show. Thanks to all of you for watching. I'm Paul Gigo. Hope to see you right here next week.